is our final lecture, um, and it is one of my favorite things to teach, which is sign language. Um, so I always start my lectures off with a small video. Uh, this is a Pepsi ad, um, and one of the things that I notice about this video is that um, it shows not only it is very inclusive in that it shows deaf and hard of hearing individuals, uh, but it shows them in a light that uh, that they would like to be perceived just as regular people, just like you know hearing people, um, and so it's like a really funny um, advert and kind of shows um, a kind of sentiment that. Deaf people, just like hearing people, can do you know everything um, except for here. And so um, when we talk about language, language is always innately tied to culture. And so a lot of things that I'm going to talk about during this lecture will be related to deaf culture. Uh, and what does it mean to be deaf in the deaf and hard of hearing community? Um, as far as sign language itself, American Sign Language, there are many varieties of sign language. American Sign Language is just one variety. Um, and it's a language that incorporates visual depictions to convey abstract ideas and concepts, um, space and movement. It has phonemes and morphemes um, and syntax. So we'll talk about uh, what are the linguistic elements that make sign language what it is a little bit later. But it is, uh, it is the fourth most used language in the United States um, after English, Spanish, Chinese, I think. Um, so... Uh, ASL is widely used, and a lot of people are using ASL. Um, ASL is also used in Canada, so you're welcome, Canadians. Um, so the, the right terminology to use, I've been taught, is capital G, deaf, uh, in the hard of hearing community. And so uh, these are people who use ASL as their native language. Uh, sign language is very much like a language, just like spoken languages, just like written languages. And so when we talk about ASL... Uh, we, we will talk about deaf people uh, with a D, and so, uh, like capital D, and um, we'll talk about also some, some faux pas and some what to do and what not to do as far as, like, communicating uh, within sign language. So a brief history of sign. Um, it's very sad when you think about uh, people not being able to... Um, express themselves or, you know, uh, as we saw with a video um, during uh, child's language acquisition about how deaf children in Nicaragua, they just kind of, you know, sat there in classrooms and didn't really understand um, because most of the part society viewed them as uh, crippled or um, there's this oralist tradition. So oralism is kind of being uh, teaching the deaf students through lip reading. And I'll talk about later about how that's very ineffective. It's very ineffective to lip read. Um, and, um, you know, and if, so for the most part, they either looked at them as crippled or they said, oh, just they pitied them. So they said there was a tragedy of the deaf uh, that because they could not um, hear, that they couldn't hear the word of God, therefore they couldn't be saved, therefore they were deficient in some way. And so they were um, severed from their family's wealth. Um, and even though this seems like it's very, um, very old, very in history, um, some of the attitudes tor towards deaf people, autism, um, con continues and persists today through a lot of things that uh, people don't mean to do, but um, it just seeps into our everyday society. So, um, you know, the French Expo, uh, the World Congress kind of came together in the 1800s and said, okay, well, let's improve the welfare of the deaf and the blind. Um, and as with any other movements, uh, sometimes it moves forward and then um, it also moves back. So uh, after some repeated, you know, uh, study and saying, okay, well, here's some ways, uh, better ways in which we can teach uh, deaf individuals, people convene and say, actually, we have an uncontestable uh, superiority over them. And so this was this backlash against deaf individuals that said that they were lesser than. And so we saw this in uh, the United States that there was a rapid increase of oralist traditions forcing deaf children to spend some time uh, by themselves um, without any interaction and having them read lips. And so um, the first school to deaf was actually in France. And so if you read up on Jeannie, uh, and how she, uh, you know, she was one of these feral children, wild child, 
Um, there's actually some um, some important news, uh, recent bit of news uh, about these children being locked away in California. Uh, and so, you know, um, Jeannie's case and a lot of other cases of wild children, when they come out of the woods, um, they have aspects of language. We are not really sure if they do know language. So uh, one of the wild children that came out uh, was in this forest in France, and so they took him to the first school of the deaf, and so this was the deaf school that they took him to. Um, so uh, it was established in Paris, and so when you think about ASL, uh, American Sign Language, ASL actually has its roots in French. It's actually very different um, than English, British Sign Language, um, even though you would assume just because as an American we understand British accents, you know, and Australian accents, but American Sign Language, British Sign Language, Australian Sign Language, Auslan uh, is very different. Um, right, so like even though it seems like a very long time ago and these attitudes are probably gone now, these attitudes actually exist today. So doctors, um, educators, it wasn't until like the 1980s that they advised their kids uh, not to learn sign and um, would instead learn English instead as their first language just because they thought it was an impede impediment. Uh, the prominent oralist of this method was Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone. Uh, and so he said that, you know, it is the, you know, it's a duty of all deaf people to learn how to hear because hearing uh, is what makes you uh, a person or hearing is what makes you part of this mainstream world. Uh, and so because of this proclamation, this was considered the dark ages for deaf education in America. Um, interestingly enough, however, 90% of deaf individuals actually have hearing parents. And so um, I believe that it's not so much that the parents, you know, think that their child is deficient in some way. Um, I think the child, the parents maybe, you know, want the best, all parents want the best for their children. And so when they see their baby turn out deaf, they don't really know what to do. And so a lot of them, they have cochlear implants or they have velvet strategies, uh, you know, lip reading or pen and paper um, to kind of accommodate hearing individuals. Um, and so this may be changing, I think. Um, the 2015 statistic, I think, is still up to date, but um, as far as the percentage. But I think that a lot of people nowadays are learning sign language, are, you know, helping to make sure that their children understand deaf culture. Um, and so I think that it's less, um, you know, that they resent deaf, and, you know, hard of hearing individuals and more so that they're becoming more in tune to the kinds of struggles uh, that deaf people um, have. So the main proponent of... Um, you know, using sign the manualist move it, movement uh, was Edward Gallaudet. And so Gallaudet, which um, if that sounds familiar, is because Gallaudet is a famous school in Washington, D.C. Completely, it's a university completely devoted for uh, teaching in sign language. And so Gallaudet kind of argued against oralism um, because uh, it restricted the deaf students to communicate. Um and that's, he said that that was akin to stripping them of their identity and their community and their culture. And so um, it was very interesting that he, uh, you know, he, he actually, he was French. And so he came to the United States. Um, he really was the one, the main proponent that said we should teach them in their native language, which is fine. And like I said, most of the connections that, ASL has is similar to French um, because we have a lot of those roots, whereas British Sign Language and Auslan uh, are very different. So deaf schools in America, um, 1864 was the first university of the deaf, um, and so there's a big proponent now for sign language. Um, so I had the opportunity to go to France like a couple years ago um, with a deaf person. It was very enlightening to see because he told me that uh, the United States actually has the most progressive uh, resources for deaf people. The United States and France, uh, more so than France, he would say, but um, as far as deaf individuals go, a lot of international students, and you'll see this at UMBC even, 
Uh, there's lots of international students that come uh, who are deaf and they uh, take classes in sign because we have the amenities here, whereas other countries, they don't. So uh, the origins of ASL, ASL is culture transmitted from generation to generation through schools and deaf adults. Was it a pigeon or a creole? So maybe it started out as a pigeon. Some people would still say it's a pigeon because it's constantly changing. Uh, ASL compared to other languages are very much still uh, being tweaked, right? And still there's new words being added every day and lexicon, people bringing their own signs from home. Um, so people would say that it's still a pigeon and not a creole, uh, but that could be very different. So Bill uh, Stuckey is his name pronounced. Um, he, while working at Dolly Debt, said that, you know, actually ASL has uh, its own syntax and its own grammar. And so linguists, when we think of what makes languages um, a language, is that it has these components. Um, but even in the 21st century, there's still no recognition of it as a language in lots of these days. So for example, um, in your high school exams, um, you could take Spanish, or you could take Chinese, or you could take, you know, ACT scores for a bunch of different languages. Um, but if you learn sign language, that wasn't enough to pass out of the foreign language requirement. It is at UMBC, but at, you know, this is different from school to school to school. Uh, and even though this is a real language, a lot of people don't view it as such. So, um, sign language is a language because, uh, it's not derived from spoken languages. Um, so people, you know, who know sign language, they're deaf and they know how to write in English. They're essentially bilingual because it's two different, completely different domains. And, um, we know that sign is a language because we see babies. So think back to, uh, the first language acquisition where we saw babies kind of grappling, um, mimicking the sign. Uh, and then, you know, they were able to, um, you know, be able to, use these gestures and use um, sign uh, and babble and sign even before they could uh, sign their first word. So all babies really uh, have, you know, this innate, if you believe in Chomsky's theories, innate uh, belief in being able to um, use sign or use language uh, and deaf babies are no different. So why do you think sign language is still not considered a language? Um, there's many theories. We talked about the last class about the standard writing system and how, um, you know, if you don't have a writing system, then a lot of people would think that you're not a legitimate language. Um, we also, there's also a lot of oralist beliefs in um, people believe that when you, you know, speaking is awesome and hearing is awesome. Uh, and so if you don't have these two components, people believe that you're defunct in some way. Um, there's crab theory, which I, you know, it's a psychological term and, um, I recently learned about it, but, um, if you're from Maryland, I hope that you know this, but when you have a barrel of crabs, uh, and a crab tries to get out, the rest of the crabs are trying to pull it back in. And that's because it, it's, I don't know about the crabs, but as far as like relating to communities, a lot of people don't want their, um, fellow person to survive out of the community and leave the community and so you'll see crowd theory in lots of like african-american communities or deaf communities is a big one and it kind of states like no we are our people uh, why should we have to accommodate for hearing people we are deaf people this is who we are uh, and then also very interesting is that there are videos of people getting cochlear implants as they cure um, and so, um, people say, oh my gosh, it's a miracle. Look at this baby. This baby can hear. Uh, and so this creates this, uh, sentiment that hearing is, uh, cure. You can cure deafness. Uh, hearing is just so awesome. And then remember back to the Alexander Graham Bell Foundation in which he says, um, and this is on the website, through advocacy, education, research, and financial aid. E.A.G. Bell helps to ensure that every child and adult with hearing loss has the opportunity to listen, talk, and thrive in mainstream society. And so look at, linguistically, look at the way that he pairs success, thriving in mainstream society, with the opportunity to listen and to talk. And so, you know, this organization, they have a big scholarship, and, you know, you should apply for the scholarship, uh, maybe, like, study, you know, sign language with it. But 
you know, if they have all this money and they're putting all this money in research uh, into how to cure deafness. Um, so as far as speech versus sign, there's very different, it's different modalities. Um, but signing, it, it involves the face, the body. Uh, we'll talk about how facial expressions are so important in sign versus speech. It's not quite so. Um, everything is visual. That is why you, um, if you ever see like a presentation being signed by an interpreter, the interpreter usually switches out halfway through. And that's because um, of eye drain. A lot of people who are deaf uh, can't look at something for too long. That's like having someone like drone on in a monotonous voice, which I hope that you're not thinking I am doing. Uh, but it's just very hard, right? Because when we think of um, a presentation, we see someone or we, you know, we look at someone, um, we have all these, these different modes, um, but, you know, when it's just someone signing, it's just one mode, and so people can get very, uh, you know, very, it can be very draining just on the viewer. Um, so signing is different, um, you know, and we have different signs, and sometimes it's not iconic. So for something to be iconic, that means it kind of represents, right, like with written language, it represents the thing itself. So A, if someone in British Sign Language is crying, this looks like crying, right? Or this looks like an airplane taking off. Um, however, this is a battery uh, in British Sign Language, and this is an afternoon. So there's nothing about these signs that connotes the thing itself. And I would say airplane. I once mimed this in the charades game and no one knew what I was saying. So um, even these signs don't represent the thing itself. And sign language is not like charades. A lot of people think that you're just playing charades, but you're not. These are actual, actual morphemes and actual words. It's not pantomime, right? So for example, if you were to pantomime smell, it would look like this. But this is, you know, a sign for flower. If you were to pantomime falling, you could just, you know, like fall over. Um, but signing, this is actually what fall is. And the same thing for airplane, right? And so sign language is not just acting out things. Uh, it's very much um, and has its own structure. There's also variations of sign. So that's another clue that we know that sign language is a language. Um, and that there's black ASL. So... Uh, black ASL comes from, like African American English, a history of segregation in which black signers are not allowed to be in the same room as white signers, and so they had a different dialects. Um, black signers are more likely to produce outside the space, uh, the, the visual space of, of how white signers would produce, uh, and they tend to uh, favor lowered variants of signs, like they have a lot of uh, cheek variants. Uh, and it borrows a lot from AAE. So, um, whereas mainstream ASL or white ASL, this is someone who's well-dressed. And black ASL, this is someone who is well-dressed. And Carolyn McGaskill is like a very famous uh, linguist at Dahlia Dip who studies black sign. So try to guess what this is. Uh, this person's doing this and white ASL versus this. So this is pregnant. Um... So for white signers, it might look a certain way. For black signers, it looks like someone got shot. Um, so what any deaf person wants you to know is that deafness is not a handicap, right? They don't see deafness as a handicap they, because everyone around them shares the same experience and they're just like, they're just like everyone else. So deafness is just like, oh, you have, you know, blonde hair or you have green eyes, right? Oh, you're deaf. That's something about who you are but doesn't. It's not like a detriment in some way. And so what about things like music or what about tasks like driving? Um, so we'd already talked about driving in the ad uh, that I showed earlier. So deaf people can still drive, right? And honestly, you really don't need hearing. Like, you know, some people will have, uh, if someone honks their horn, it will flash a bright light um, at you. But even in my car, if I get close to something, it will flash a light at me. Uh, and so um, driving is something that it doesn't, um, deaf people don't feel as an impediment and things like music um, I once had a student who was like a big frat boy and he went to some of the parties at Gaudi Dead and he said that it was like the loudest 
party he's ever been to because you know they feel the vibrations of the music and they don't necessarily you know and i th- you know here obviously but um also when you think about music and loud and whether things are loud it's very culturally constrained because what we what someone might think is loud some other cultures might not um and so um you know i thought that was very interesting as well um but there are definitely can they can definitely enjoy music they can definitely drive uh they don't see themselves as being different in any way so what would it look like for a science supported world this is a very fantastic video of someone who you know um she, he's got being duped but his sister kinds of kind of makes everyone learn sign just for a day and just for a day we see uh, I don't want to get too many spoilers but um you know it's it might seem that it's very hard to learn sign or to you know produce sign but just like being able to speak another person's language um, I think that person would really enjoy it and then this is a video from Nye DeMarco who's the winner of America's Next Top Model um, I think a few cycles back uh, but he was completely deaf and so he's kind of teaching a few words about uh, some signs that are slang um, to show you that you know deaf people just like you know people who speak also can produce uh, slang words and then all the I know there's a lot of videos but this is also a nice video about this uh, woman who uh, is a sign language uh, interpreter for concerts and um, she's kind of revolutionizing how deaf people, when they go to see concerts, uh, what they like to see as far as um, the music, just the lyrics, or do you want to get the full body experience? And so she tries to provide that for a lot of deaf individuals. So in talking about the linguistic components of sign, uh, we know that the gram- sign language has a grammar and that the facial expressions, the head movements, eye gaze, all contribute to the grammar. Um, we also know that the typical grammar is time, topic, or comment. So you say yesterday, topic is going to the store, and you'll comment, I bought some cheese, right? Um, some would argue the syntax is subject verb object. This is highly contested. And so a lot of people would say this is why uh, the grammar, the grammar is probably why ASL, some people would consider it still a pigeon and not a creole. Movement, so there's lots of different movements that sign language has and it refers to the hand actions that form words. And so there's different movements that you could have with your hands that determine kind of the different meanings of the words. Configuration of the palm, so when you're signing numbers, there's a certain way that you have to sign numbers, like numbers have to be signed palm in. Uh, orientation, orientation is where your, um, like your hands is it up or is it down. Location is where uh, if you have the same hand shape and the same movement um, and the same orientation, but the different location, that changes the meanings of the word. So for example, if you do this sign above your forehead, this means summer. If you do it above your nose, this means ugly. And if you do it below your chin, on your chin, it means dry. So how would you say this summer was ugly and dry? There's lots of facial expressions, right? And facial expressions um, are very important because they add nuance to the sentence. And so, for example, uh, in Chinese, if you want to ask a question, you would ask the tonal marker ma at the end, right? Um, and so when someone says ma, right, that kind of connotes a question. Or if you're an English speaker, you would say na 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 right so you have rising intonation at the end of your sentences and that's how i know that that's a question which is very confusing for a british speaker because british speakers go down so they say na 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 right like do you want to go to the store um which is what my british friend says and i was like i don't know if that's a question or not and asl facial expressions that's how you know it's a question so they'll they'll raise their eyebrows and kind of show you that uh this is this is asking a question so if you're happy, you have to be very happy, you can show very gradients of happy. Um, this person's really funny because I don't really know what she says or what she's saying. Maybe you can comment on the discussion board if you know. 
Um, we know that ASL has morphology. So for example, if you're adding movement to the sign give, uh, you can add variations that says give to all, give to each, give to each other. Right, so you know this is give, but this is to give continually, and this is to give to each. Uh, so it's kind of like how we have you know different inflections like gave, given, been given, has been giving. You know, so all these different uh, word inflections, ASL does that through their signs. We know that the language is also grammatical because there's constraints on two-handed signs. So for example, you can have two hands which are the same shape and both hands are moving. You can have two hands that are the same shape, one hand moves. So this is a coffee, the sign for coffee. Or you can have two hands, different shapes, and one hand moves. But you can have two hands, different shapes, both hands move. This cannot occur in ASL. And it's very hard to move your hands in different shapes, right? Uh, and it's very hard also for the, the receiver to understand what you're saying or what you're signing. Um, and this is true also if, for example, you broke your arm and um, the other person, the receiver, can figure out what you're saying on the other side using your hand that's not dominant because it can just mirror whatever your sign is. And so it's very hard for you to have two hands that are very different shapes. Uh, another reminder is that signing is not finger spelling. Um, so they'll finger spell if they, um, if it's like, a, you know, they want, you're introducing someone for a uh, name for the first time. You don't know how to spell it. So they'll finger spell. Um, but as far as like finger spelling should only be used in those kinds of introductory contexts and not always. Uh, so there's another institute of uh, for sign in Rhode Island, and they originally they taught this. They taught um, English and taught sign in, the, in just like signing the letters. Uh, and then after a while, they said that this was like not very effective. Um, and so this is you know the system. Um, however, if finger spelling is the only thing you can do, a lot of deaf people would uh, like to welcome it. So for example, one of my students, she worked as a waitress, and when she was uh, serving someone, she knows that this group of deaf people came in, and so she was like, oh, let me take your order in, in fingerspelling, right? So fingerspelling is the only thing that you know how to do. They're not going to get offended. Uh, actually, I think they, they would really appreciate it because it's something that um, you're trying to learn about their culture. Uh, right, so it's not substitute for sign, but it's used to give the name of a people or identify a movie title. Um, and so uh, they don't like finger spelling because it's very akin to English orthography. And so again, the the focus is not on English; it's more on sign as the language. Indexing or pointing um, is very cool because you know when you want to reference someone, you can say you can point to someone. Uh, and this, you know, this is what I talked about with a question. Like he's asking a question, you know that because he has raised eyebrows. Um, <clears throat> so when there's two deaf people, uh, or sorry, three deaf people, and then one of them leaves the room, you can point to the space that that person has left the room, uh, and to refer back to that person. So that's called spatial reference. Spatial organization, you can talk about things, uh, by establishing a location, by pointing to the same location. Um, and then writing, you know, because signing and writing are two different completely different things, two different domains. Deaf individuals who know both are essentially bilingual. Uh, one thing about the signs, like language, they are very arbitrary. So for example, this is the sign for possible in ASL. Or sorry, possible in ASL and way in Finnish sign language. So even though it's the same sign, it means very different. And then here is also a uh, brother in Chinese sign language and Korean sign language. In Japanese sign language. So very, very, very arbitrary. So there's variations in hand shape. So for example, you know, this is candy on your cheek because your cheek looks like candy maybe. This is apple 
with the, the knuckle kind of raised, and then this is jealous, right? And then look at his facial expressions for jealous. So the variations in hand shape could be considered like variations in our phonemes. So for example, like cat, bat, and mat, right? We know that those words are very similar in spelling, but they mean very different things. This is very similar, right? Candy, apple, and jealous. They have maybe the same, um, you know, spatial organization, uh, but different variations mean different words. Palm orientation, want is open palm versus freeze um, is, you know, closed palmed. Phonetics, uh, primes are like distinctions and phonemes. So this is an apple. If you put it closer to your nose, it becomes garlic. Morphology. Um, so we have a, uh, you know, rule in linguistics where you double everything. So for example, uh, back to pigeons and creoles, uh, the word talky talky means someone who speaks a lot, someone who talks a lot, right? So if you say talky talky, uh, that creates a totally different word. The same thing here. So if you say eat, so like bringing these uh, fingers close to your mouth, that's eat. But if you do it twice, it means food. Or if you do sit, so you have two fingers over your other two fingers. If you do it twice, it means chair. Compounding, so it's very similar to spoken speech. So how do I know the difference between hot dog and hot dog? Hot dog and hot dog, right? How do I know the difference? It's because the stress and the timing, right? So I know a hot space dog is a dog sitting in a car, right? Whereas a hot dog is something that you eat. And the same thing, right? So blue spot, you would do blue spot. A blue spot would be a bruise, right? And so um, over time, you don't really need to use blue. You can just point to a spot. Maybe you have a look on your face that says like, ow, right? So the person that knows exactly what you're talking about. And so ASL, like other languages, it's changing. Um, this is the older form of cow, uh, and it's still used in British Sign Language. However, this is the American version of cow, uh, the newer version. You only need one. Um, that makes sense, right? Because, you know, harking back to written language where, uh, you know, simplified Chinese characters, they, sh they shave off some of the, uh, the unneeded letters. The same thing for ASL here. So... Um, you know, for some of the, the words, like this is the older version of ASL, um, people would like it to be less like English orthography. Same thing for fingerspelling. They like it to be kind of the older version of ASL because uh, it's not like they want to keep out hearing people, but they're very, very, very proud of who they are, and they're very, very proud of their language. Uh, so if they're going to make changes to the language, they're going to make sure that Nothing is related to English spelling, right? Everything is has its own sign, and its own grammar. So, um, in talking about autism, so autism, um, like racism, sexism, you know, uh, any of the isms, is this attitude that believes that uh, people are inferior in some way, and so this is the stigma that says that someone who does not hear is inferior in some way. And so uh, it can happen with hearing individuals and in deaf um, individuals as well. Um, and this could be something that you don't even notice that you're doing. So for example, um, here's some all this some um, examples. Jumping in to help a deaf person communicate, asking a deaf person to lip read, making phone calls for a deaf person because they can't, refusing to call an interpreter, asking a deaf person to tone down their facial expressions because it makes other people comfortable uncomfortable, refusing to explain to a deaf person why someone is laughing around them, saying, never mind, I'll tell you later, it doesn't matter. Even, I'm not deaf, and I hate this when someone's laughing, like, just stop and tell me the joke, right? Even if it's not funny, just tell me the joke. Um, forcing a deaf child to spend hours in speech therapy instead of playing at recess. So these are things that are well-intentioned, of course, right? But it's something that harbors the belief that a deaf person is uh, needing help. Uh, so, for example, making phone calls. People will probably assume that deaf people can't make phone calls. But um, deaf people, all this, they FaceTime, right? So they can use FaceTime for a lot of different things. Uh, and so it's not like they need to use um, the traditional methods that hearing people would use. Um, this one, the tone down their facial expressions, this is very, very, very rude. 
because um, facial expressions is key to understanding their meaning, uh, and so they need the these these things. And so, why is it harmful to ask someone, "Can you lip read? Like, read my lips, right?" It's because lip reading is a very improper art, and so you can watch this video about inauguration day. I thought it was super hilarious, uh, and it talks about how lip reading is not the most effective. Uh, because a lot of things in English languages, in the English language, looks very similar. Pay me, baby, maybe. I'll have two. I love shoes. Elephant snoots. Olive juice. I love you. Uh, so, right. So, it's very, very, very imprecise. Always ask the deaf person who wishes to communicate how they would like to be, um, how they would like to communicate. A lot of times, if you don't know sign language and they know how to write, for example, they'll just type on their iPhone. And that's what, how, uh, I don't know ASL, but, you know, the person I went to France with who was deaf, um, he basically, um, you know, just wrote everything on his phone and I could read it. Um, so talking about deaf culture, deaf culture uh, tries to fight some of these autism beliefs. Um, and deaf culture has a very, very, very strong bond. And so deaf culture, they participate in a lot of social activities. So um, if you know Flying Dog Brewery in Frederick, Maryland, uh, there's ASL interpreted tours, which is cool. Um, and they have athletic tournaments and social gatherings. And so they're a very, very, very strong social community. Um, so a lot of people are part of the deaf community, including uh, parents who might be hearing um, and I think that deaf culture also tries to um, promote deafness in a lot of different ways. So here's some new movies uh, that incorporate sign language. Uh, Master of None season two, although a little iffy with the season, sorry. Um, but I like the fact that he included ASL. Uh, this movie a student told me about, it's a horror movie. So if you're not into horror, I wouldn't watch it. Uh, but it's on Netflix and it's called Hush. Shape of Water just came out, right? And so um, this person, even though uh, they can hear, they use sign language. Uh, and so this is, you know, I thought that was very revolutionary to incorporate a character uh, and have sign be her mode of communication. So some do's, uh, you know, so you can watch uh, other people sign. Uh, with an interpreter, it's always a good idea to watch the person, not the interpreter. Because the interpreter is not the one that's talking. You're talking to the person. Don't dress in bright colors because it becomes very distracting for people. Don't eye drop on someone else's conversation. I do this all the time when I'm walking around UMBC. Um, don't beat around the bush. Be blunt. right? So I had a student who was taking this ASL class and um, her teacher said, okay, describe the person next to you. And she said, oh, okay, well, this person's blonde hair, this person has green eyes, you know, um, this person is like 5'7", uh, and her teacher said, well, you didn't mention the fact that she was fat. And she was like, what? And that's because uh, as far as deaf people communicate, you can't beat around the bush. Everything's very language dependent, sign dependent, uh, and so it's very, um, it's very difficult to kind of understand some of the nuances uh, of language, although that might might also be changing. If you want to get that person's attention, just simply wave to the person um, or flash some lights or stop on the floor. Um, if you need to pass between two people signing, you can just bow your head and sign excuse me. And if you have like a deaf uh, if you interact with deaf people, um, it's very inappropriate to say, oh, my name is, and just like make up a sign. Your sign has to be earned by the community. Um, and this is something to where, uh, this is a part of like, I think language appropriation in that uh, deaf people have had to, um, were named and given their names by, uh, by hearing people. And so if you want to um, interact with deaf individuals, always ask them for your name. And they'll know something about you. It's usually like, oh, your hair color, your eye color, or, you know, something about your personality. So um, I had a student, her name was Sharon, 
and her um, name and sign was nice. And she was like, I don't really like that because like I'm more than just nice. She was really nice. Um, but she had to petition the deaf community for a new name. She couldn't just say, okay, I don't want to be called nice. I want to be called, you know, this or whatever. Speaking of names, what is the sign? This is Obama. So what's Trump? So you can see the deaf community don't, uh, don't really like Trump as much. When you arrive late to a meeting, it's always expected that you stop and explain why you're late. Uh, and then they usually share school information because there's a tight network. So there's improvements in technology as far as learning how to sign uh, and how people can um, are now taking sign language like very seriously. And I like to see that in a lot of different aspects. Okay, so dilemma of cochlear implants. So cochlear implants um, are, it's a, a form of surgery that if you have a child and you're hearing impairment, a lot of doctors would recommend uh, that your children have the surgery. However, it can be very invasive because they drill into your skull uh, and enable the sound to reach the brain um, because they're s stimulating the hearing nerve. And so it's kind of like they have this uh, device in which you can turn on or turn off your cochlear implant. So there's benefits and some risks. Some benefits is that you're able to detect some sounds. You can talk on the telephone. You can enjoy loud music. Um, and so it's very uh, successful, and a lot of people are very happy with their cochlear implant. However, some risks are that it's an invasive surgery, especially for children very, very young. And I usually like to do it on children because um, they like, you know, learning a language is something that they do before the critical period hypothesis. Critical period, sorry. And so um, if you're going to do it, it's better to learn a language when you're young. And a lot of people don't want their children to have uh, the speaking effects um, of a deaf person. And so they would rather their children have the surgery. Um, however, even though that cochlear implants may still impact speaking. However, some would argue that it's a form of cultural genocide. In that if, you're a deaf, uh, if your child is born deaf, uh, you're taking that deaf culture away from them. There's also other options that people can do, such as auditory uh, verbal therapy. And so they have children learn how to lip read, uh, learn speech reading, understand spoken language. And so if um, the cochlear implant, you don't just get a cochlear, that's it. But sometimes it's coupled, especially depending on how old the child is, coupled with auditory verbal therapy. Um, Ontario public support um, has not been available. And so, again, going back to autism. Right, so when I talked about, like, why people don't think that deaf um, or sign language is a real language is these videos that say, like, oh, someone has a cochlear implant, right? It's a modern-day miracle. They can finally hear. Um, but if you look at the child, I think the child is more, like, scared and freaked out more so than anything uh, because they can all of a sudden hear you know, wind, they can hear thunderstorms, they can hear, like, someone breathing, right? Uh, so a lot of my deaf people, uh, deaf friends say that being deaf is very peaceful, right? That you don't really have to concern yourself with, like, loud noises. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful documentary, and you should watch the whole thing on YouTube. It's available on YouTube, but it's called The Sound and Fury. Uh, I won an Emmy, like, you know, years and years and years ago. But it kind of talks about the trials of this um, deaf family who, um, you know, one of them has a, a deaf daughter who wants a cochlear. The other one, uh, they're, you know, they have hearing parents and they want also want, um, they go through the cochlear procedure. Um, so the grandma, in this instance, she wants her, she's, hearing and she wants her granddaughter to have a cochlear but her deaf son is very against it and so um it just kind of tells you about the dilemma of cochlear implants even within the families it runs very deep uh and also i like this video about how cochlear implants even though she got one doesn't really take away her deaf culture uh that she's able to interact with other people um and so i think that deaf culture might be changing uh and that 
they are more accepting now of people with cochlear implants than they are than they were before. So, discussion question option one. Congratulations, you and your partner just gave birth to a baby. Your doctor informs you that your child has severe hearing loss, so you could uh, have several options. You could A, proceed with the surgery and put them in AV speech therapy. B, sign up for cochlear implants and sign language education. C, no surgery, teach your, completely, teach your child completely in sign language. So, pick one of the following choices and argue which one you would pick and why. Or option two, what are your experiences with deaf and hard of hearing individuals or interaction with deaf culture? What are some ways in you see that all this thing is changing? Is it changing? Uh, what are ways in which society or culture can be improved to benefit the deaf community? Um, so we'll stop there. Um, other than that, thanks for listening to my lectures and putting up with the sound of my own voice uh, for quite some time. And I will see you on the discussion board. Also, don't forget about your final paper. I think I say that here, actually. No, I don't. Okay, well, don't forget about your final paper.